Hi, this is Phil Cash, and welcome to the Winter Circle. This is episode seven of season one. Uh, for those of you who have or have not listened to the Winter Circle, uh, what we do in this podcast is we interview the winner of last week's national two-day PRS match. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get some information, uh, extrapolate knowledge and, and insight and methods and practices that you know, that the shooter that won that two-day national match uh, uses to be able to put himself or herself in position to be able to, you know, to, to win a national PRS match, which is ridiculously hard to do. And, you know, we talked about this, you know, precision rifle shooters worldwide, we've, you know, we, I think without question, we have the best in the world. So when you win a national two-day PRS match, it's a really big deal. Um, so what, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent shooter. Uh, I try and gain knowledge and experiences from those who have done better than I have, uh, in matches. And that's what kind of led to us doing the winter circle. So we can kind of share some of that knowledge with the shooting community to kind of help all of us get better. Uh, so this week we're going to be interviewing Morgan King. Morgan won the BNT, um, box Canyon showdown in Let's see, where was that in Medicine Lodge, Kansas? Medicine Lodge. Yeah, Medicine Lodge, yep. Kansas. I'm sure everyone's been to Medicine Lodge, Kansas before. Um, maybe not, but um, it is pretty country. Yeah. Well, the the finale is going to be there this year, so that's that's going to be. It was a good it was a good tune up for you, but people might want to look into an Airbnb or something now because uh, it is remote. Really? Okay. Yeah. Like, well, they're just not a lot there. Well, so, so to uh, to everyone, this is uh, Morgan King. Uh, Morgan, uh, most of you know, has been heavily involved in the PRS and the NRL for for many years now. Um, we'll kind of get into his his uh, his performances, which have been pretty strong. But um, but let's kind of get started with some of the basics. So, Morgan, what can you tell us about yourself, and how did you get into precision rifle shooting? I'm from Hayesville, Utah. Um, I'm 30 years old now, getting old. Uh, and uh, anyways, I got two kids, a wife, and I'm in vet school. And right now we're living in in Pullman, Washington, up here at Washington State. I'm about to start my – finishing up my third year, about to start my fourth year of vet school. And so that keeps us pretty busy. But uh, as much as I can, I go to – I'll fly around and go to as many matches as possible uh, this last weekend – like I flew into into Wichita Friday afternoon and flew out Sunday afternoon so I could get home and take a test Monday morning and then sleep off the sickness I got. So if if, if my voice sounds weird and I cough a little bit during this, that's why. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I could hardly speak at the awards. I was just telling Phil about that. Um, but I got into shooting because I – growing up, I've always hunted and – I remember first time uh, I go hunting and I got my mom's 243, which is what everybody shoots their first deer in my family with just because it just, that thing, it, I mean, it's, we looked it up the other day. I think it was born or I mean, or not born. It was, well, essentially the same thing, but it was built in this uh, mid sixties and wow. it's got like an old Leopold four power scope on it with the old German crosshair in it. And I don't think, I think it's only been cited in one time, but I mean, it is always that, I mean, it's deadly. Um, you pull that thing out. It's a old Savage, I think model 99 lever action. And, uh, anyways, I get, I we across this Canyon and where we hunt out in Utah, it's big country, like a lot, a lot of cross Canyon shots. So I, I pull out the gun and it's probably 350, 400 yards across there because i have no idea because we didn't get range finders till a lot, a lot later but i i jump off my horse and there's a nice little four point my dad goes you better hold over top of his back and i was like what what you know i was 14 years old and i'm like and then my dad goes gravity idiot pull the trigger <laughs> and so i i hold over his back and i drop the deer and uh but i remember in my mind i was like well, yeah that makes sense why wouldn't i have thought about that and that was the first time where I was like, 
well, how did he know how far to hold over? And how do you know how far it is? And how do you know how much and what distance? And I'm sitting here and I remember just sitting there after I shot that buck and was like, like, yeah, it's my first buck, but my gosh, we just did something else over here. Let's figure out that deal. And, uh, try and, and that's where it got me thinking. And it, I went down a rabbit hole that I just haven't come out of yet. <laughs> that's, that's what's got you into shooting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, long range it, shooting. it snowballed from there. I mean, I got a 223, um, to hunt coyotes with and put a scope of turrets on it and then got a range finder and started to figure out this and that. And yeah, finally I built myself a custom rifle and got into competitions, but I mean, it's kind of been this slow progression. I learned how to reload, um, shortly after that hunt and yeah, it's just been a kind of a, a whirlwind and then the competition thing has made it like i got into competitions just because well hey i can, now i can shoot long range i figured out how the ballistics things work but how do i get better at shooting and and like home this to where when i show up and i um when i put my crosshairs on the buck how do i make sure that i like i am able to do it and be able to make a good clean ethical first shot kill at whatever distance it is because i mean like out here in the west you're prevent you're presented with all kinds of um, different ranges you know you you might jump a bucket 100 yards and run out across the face 150 yards from you and you got to just jump off and shoot him or you you uh which is most of the time i you glass one up at at 650 you know, you might glass him up at 2000 and then ride in there, walk as close as you can. And it's, it's across the Canyon and it's 800 yards by the time you get close. And if you try to get closer, you're probably going to jump him or you can just shoot him in his bed because it's not that hard of a shot with the training and practice that we've put into it. And that's kind of where the competition thing started for me is trying to get that skill honed. And then from there, it's become its own thing. And well, it's pretty, it's kind of taken over even the hunting thing. I mean, I, I still hunt a lot, but I shoot a lot more. Wow. That's pretty cool. Now, how did, uh, who, who actually, who, who actually got you into shooting your first like PRS or NRL match? Paul Egley. We were in the sportsman's parking lot in Logan, Utah. And I remember I show up to the range one day and I had at the, I had my first custom rifle and, uh, we show, I show up to the public range there and he was there cause he, he still, he lives a half a mile down the road from this thing lives around the corner. He'll leave his, he'll like, he'll go load bullets and then like, uh, throw his gun in the passenger seat, leave his spotter and everything set up there. And then this is what, cause this is when it's closed, you know, and he's got a pass so he can just get, he's got a key to the gate and he'll, he'll just go back to his house, load 10 more rounds, then drive back, pull his gun out, shoot 10 rounds, then drive back to the house. That's how he does low development. And he's like, my barrel cools in that amount of time. I'll be back in 10 minutes. That's awesome. But yeah, we, uh, I was there obviously during public time. Cause you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a steel erection company and didn't put in all the baffles at the shooting range. So I don't get quite the, uh, privileges he does. And, uh, anyways, we show up there and this has been, Oh shoot. It's been quite a few years ago, probably almost eight years ago now. And, uh, I, I pull out my, uh, it's a custom seven millimeter and I start shooting and he's shooting and, and I get talking cause we both like to talk. So we were sitting there talking and, uh, pretty soon he's like, we ought to come to some matches. And I was like, Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then I go home and next I like, couple days later i see him in the sportsman's parking lot and we start talking again he's like hey there's a competition that's not very far from here you ought to come do it with me i was like all right so i enter and we we go and then i i do all right and we go to more and then pretty soon man we haven't stopped going so it just got bigger and bigger that's great. Paul's a great guy for those of you who don't know if you, you, you if you've ever seen paul before you know when you see him that's uh, right. But one of the one of the great guys in this sport, that is for sure. The jolliest guy in the PRS right there. 
<laughs> he's got, he's got the, he's got the beard to go along with that, doesn't he? That's right. Well, good deal, man. Well, okay. So tell us, tell us about the match this past weekend. Well, uh, it's a ton of troop lines. I mean, it was kind of the stereotypical, uh, uh, corn belt match, you know, like it's, it was, uh, a, a lot of wind. Well, I don't know. It wasn't like a ton of high velocity wind, you know, like we dealt with in the range between 12 and well, sometimes, I mean, it even dropped below 10, but, but, uh, for the most part, it was between 12 and 20 miles an hour. And, but so it wasn't a ton of it, but, but it would just go up and down. And then when the, the worst part was, is if, is if it would at least blow, like I liked it when it blew harder because and then it would make up its mind. But when it got down, especially say it did dip below 10, that was the worst because then it would go one way, then the other one way, then the other. And, uh, it was, it seemed like we were shooting in a headwind most of the, well, a lot of the time or a tailwind. Um, but you shot, what's cool about this place for anybody that hasn't been to box Canyon is you're shooting on one side of the highway and the other side of the highway. And you shoot, I want to say 120 degrees on both sides of the highway. So as you go down the line, you shoot one side and then you go all the way across and then you go across the road and then you shoot the other way, just like that as you go down the deal. And a lot of stages are these, you know, 20, 30, sometimes even, 60 degree pans and wow. so you, you've got a lot of different wind angles mm -hmm. and i counted them last night there's 13 of the 20 stages were troop lines and uh most of the stages were were prone modified prone stuff like that with some positional scattered throughout you know but it made it to where it was pretty like you were thinking more than um than usual which for me, that's that's my favorite types of matches. Is ones that make you think a lot. I know, um, like the shoot, you obviously you got to have your shooting on point, but but you've got to be really thinking about, um, you know, what did you what did you need to hold on this one, or what did you hold? But more important, what did you need to hit that target? You know, say you hit the target, but were you a tenth left or a tenth right, and what does that mean for the next shot? the whole match you know that wow. was that was uh pretty much the moral of the story wow well it was the um so you had when from from 10 to 20 uh was it did you have any rain or any um any inclement weather no it was great weather man it was nice sunny wow so, uh yeah zero day was like they said 25 miles an hour i don't know i wasn't there i was driving across kansas at that point and uh i guess i got there in time i could have went over there but i was like 25 mile an hour wind i ain't going over there it's, it's not even worth it so i i just that next morning there was time and everybody checked zero in the morning because everybody who wanted to zero in 25 miles an hour wind even though <laughs> i mean you can put it in your cash flow it's very reliable like if you got a 25 mile an hour crosswind and I talked to several people that did it. It was full value uh, at the zero board, and they were two and a half tenths or three tenths left, two and a half tenths um, high because it was coming from right to left, 25 miles an hour. And if you put it in your kestrel, that's exactly where you ought to be. The only trouble is, and because Brian Neese, he was there for zero, and me and him were talking about it because uh, we travel and shoot a lot together. And he said a lot of people were zero in their guns based on that. Yep. And that if if there's one thing you don't want to do is do that you want to look at your kestrel put in the wind put it in at obviously at 100 yards because your crosswind jump and all that's going to happen in the first 100 yards but but you want to get your windage as well figure out how far off it is but a lot of people he said he told people and people are like no nah, i don't believe it i'm like how do you not believe it i mean it i can see it i've done it i don't know how many times you know like you show up and Anyways, but that's beside the point. But uh, yeah, because he says, "Oh, I was two and a half tenths high and three tenths left," so I didn't even worry about it. And then shot at distance and everything lined up, and then you know he was good to go the rest of the match. But yeah, a lot of people showed up and that they just zeroed to that, and then pretty soon they're wondering why they're uh, three tenths right and two tenths low all weekend. Wow. Yeah. Or hopefully I... they caught it the next morning. I don't know. 
maybe 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 sometime midday <laughs> after, they, after they've had a few less than ideal stages um yeah yeah you know, I, th I think you know i think that happens a lot you know when you know you you wherever your home is you you know you're you have a nice calm day you don't have any mirage you zero your rifle and then you go to another location elevation may be different what have you and you, and you start overthinking the zero and you know the your two tenths higher two tenths low left or right whatever and it's amazing how many people don't uh, before they start making that adjustment don't kind of step back and think about what they're doing um, yeah i definitely i definitely look at that first right windage is or that but and i think part of it is some people don't shoot in it enough yeah. like you know say they're from the east coast or whatever and they're not used to shooting in that kind of volume of wind well i mean you've shot enough all over the place and everybody knows you're a heck of a shooter so yeah but uh they they just don't know right they they never would have thought hey well, i should put it in my kestrel and see where that that should put me um and i learned a long time ago if you're gonna check your zero you may as well fix it you know what i'm mean? if you're gonna spend the rounds and the time to check your zero you better figure out what's going on and make sure you're zero. Cause there is certain things like, I mean, if you've ever flown to a match and watched the people on the tarmac, what they do to your gun, there's your gun's got an excuse to be off when you get there. I mean, yeah. and then boys chuck that thing around and jump on it and all who knows what else, you know? So, and it's gone clear up and, you know, and been in negative six, 70 for, I don't know how long for two hours and then come back down to you know 60 degrees that's a big temperature change screws can come loose all kinds of stuff so that's another thing i always check my screws after i get off the plane to make sure everything's tight still um just because i don't ever want that to happen that just sounds like a bad situation to be in but yeah i mean so you want to you want to definitely check it but then not i, I guess you want to take into account what's what are things that could change my zero or make my point of impact not be exact at a hundred yards, but, but it actually still be good. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, I remember, you know, at the first finale I went to was out in Tehachapi in California and you know, the, the range was, we didn't typically have matches out there. So they kind of had to create the course of fire and I mean, there was a range, but not like a PRS range and where they had a zeroing uh, you're kind of shooting a little bit uphill and about halfway in between where you're shooting prone and the target, which is elevated, was a hill and had like a crest of a hill. So you're just seeing over the crest of this hill when you're taking your shot at the, at the 100 yard zero target. And everybody, everybody was off in their elevation. And, you know, just because of the, the effect of that mirage and the heat coming off that hill, it was right you know, halfway between you and that 100 yard target. And I was getting ready to change my zero and Brian Allen came over. He's like, uh, uh, son, don't you be doing that. <laughs> you know, and he, and he just, he said, think about what you're doing and what do you see halfway between here and that target? And I'm like, ah, and then you look down the line. It was amazing how many people, and this is the finale back in 2015, mind you. Uh, but how many people were adjusting their zero when they didn't need to be doing it because that affected that mirage, that heat coming off that hill halfway between where I'm shooting in that target just was lying to me about where the bullet was going it wouldn't be a bad idea in that situation to pull out like a tack table and another tripod and just try to get up a little higher. Yeah. Even though, in, cause I'd still want to check it. Cause like, it's so hard to lead. Like I say, if you, if you check it, you may as well fix it. But, but like you say, in that situation, it's like, well, could it be this? Could it be that? A lot of times in that situation, cause uh, there's, where is it? Like a lot of times I don't like to lay down to zero for, because of what you're saying, unless it's like early in the morning when the ground's cool. But as soon as it heats up and all of a sudden you have all that mirage coming off, I don't want to lay on the ground to zero because I feel like you're going to get elevation in your zero a lot, which whatever, maybe not like sometimes no, I'm sure. But, but like you say in that situation, for sure. Yeah. Well, okay, so at the match uh, this weekend, so you ended up winning by one shot. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Austin shot real good. So it was, it was yeah. a tight competition uh, right there at the top. So you had a number of shooters that were all in position to win the match, and you ended up winning, which good for you. Uh, how, how Did you know where you stood after the match on, on Saturday? 
Yeah, yeah, I called Austin about 30 seconds after I got done shooting. <laughs> so we knew. I I called and said, uh, and he answered, and he's like, oh, I'm down 15. I said, oh, I'm down 16. Cool, all right. And he, uh, he's like, I was like, how do you feel about it? Well, I th- he's like, I think I did pretty good. It'd be pretty sporty if somebody beat me. I was like, oh, I don't feel quite as good as you, but I mean, I, I he's like, yeah, I mean, I think we both probably should have been, because I was thinking in my mind, I probably should have been down maybe 10, 9, would have been better, you know, because I had some unexplainable deals or like some couple elevation. He's like, yeah, yeah. Well, both of us counted wrong. He was down 14 and I was down 17 because we just hadn't gone through our book yet. We just kind of gave him the, the number off the top of our head, you know, and then but when I realized I counted wrong, I was like, oh, somebody will be ahead of me as well. But Austin might be in the lead. And uh, anyways, yeah, so it turned out like, yeah, he was in the lead by three. And then I was I was only ahead a third by one point. But then after day two got done, both of us shot pretty good. And uh, we were – Austin was ahead of third place by ten points. I was ahead of him by one, barely. Wow. So we wow. kind of, all the two man race, us, wasn't it? Yeah, we kind of, I didn't know, I didn't think that because I mean, I, on my last stage, I dropped three and was kind of beside myself, you know. And, and uh, yeah, but yeah, because I, I didn't think it was that hard of a stage, but uh, I sure made it look kind of hard. And, but, uh, and I, I called up uh, Austin, he hadn't shot yet. So he, he, I, he didn't answer his phone. So I called Clay and Clay's like, Oh, I, how many down? I was like, I told him, he's like, oh, you probably got it then. Cause he knew how many Austin was down. I didn't know. Cause I drove past him cause we're in golf carts and stop. And as he, er, right as he's finishing it up and then he counted and we've kind of figured, but we're like, honestly, somebody else could have had a good day and been ahead. Both of us. No problem. Like I, I thought there was a chance, you know, there's some other people in there. I mean, you know, because I've shot pretty good, so you're like, yeah, if somebody beat me, I guess pretty sporty. Like, you just shake their hand and tell them that's a hell of a job, but, you know, it's uh, it had been a thing to do it, you know. Wow. So you're ahead of Austin by one, and then he was ahead of third place by ten shots? Mm-hmm. My goodness, that's – um. Yeah, that's uh, separating yourselves from the field. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Austin shot really good. That's that's for sure. No, there's no no doubt about that. So, yeah, I mean, both yeah. of us. Yeah, Austin's a great shooter. I mean, he's, he's he's one of the best. He's one of the best out there and a really good fellow. And just you know, I shot with him I think last year in Mississippi, I believe, and that was the first time he and I squatted together. And we had a great time. Really, really good dude. Yeah, you know what I like about all them guys from Oklahoma and stuff right there? They're all good guys. Yeah. They love to run their mouths, but it's like a – but they're – once you get to know them, they're just messing around. <laughs> they, just love to, they just love to blow smoke. Oh, they do, don't they? <laughs> well, a lot of times they back it up, so, you know. That's my favorite. Oh, I love to do it too, so there ain't nothing about that that I find uh, appalling at all. It's great. All right, so you started shooting two-day national PRS matches in 2016. I think when I looked on the PRS website, you shot a couple in late 2016 and then uh, got in some in 17 and 18. Um, But but since then, you've won 14 national two-day PRS matches, 14, uh, which I believe – is tied for the most victories in the PRS during that period of time with Jake Vibbert. Oh, uh, really? Since, and since 20, that 2016 forward, both you guys have won uh, 14 matches. That's uh, pretty you, cool. Yeah. Um, 16, you've had 16 additional top fives. So 30 matches you've been in, in the top five or one. You've also won 24 regional PRS matches in that, in that period of time. Dude, you you have become very comfortable at the top of the leaderboard. <laughs> I mean that, and uh, you also won the last two NRL Centerfire Championships. Uh, yeah. And I I know you've won a lot of, of NRL two day national matches. 
Uh, dude, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, like what that yeah. is, you, you, uh, you, many, many would say that since 2016, you've been the best PRS shooter in the country. And I remember well, for a period I don't of time know about there since 2016, because there were some guys before me. I don't, I don't know that if I really woke up until about 2019, 2020-ish, because I, I really hadn't done anything until then, just kind of learning, you know. Well, but, it's a it's a lot a lot of a lot of a lot of wins. I appreciate it though. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a period of time over about a 12 month period where I think you won 15 between the NRS, NRL and PRS. You won 15 national two day matches. And that's yep. incredible. So, yep. man, how in the world have you done it? What's the secret to get, get, you know, tell us I mean, like, I, what, if what, I had the secret, I would, I'd love to share it with people. Cause I just, yeah, I don't really know. I do know one thing that, that it, most of it's in your head. I, I did some, I, I try to keep a journal, um, on shooting on, on like what I do and stuff. Um, like whether it's a mistake or whether it's something I did good or my mindset or how I felt. Cause there's sometimes, uh, how I feel, um, has something to do with it, but getting, making sure I get into the right mindset every time is something that's big for me. But, uh, cause it seems to, to be that most of it's my, uh, mindset. Like, uh, yeah, I've had, uh, last couple matches before this, I had some issues that I don't care. I, it just seemed like it didn't matter what I did. I make perfect trigger pull correction, whatever. And the next round was not going where I wanted it to. And that's frustrating. Um, so to kind of come out this side of it, um, and be able to, to win, that's good. But, uh, anyways, the thing I, I get where I was getting at with my journal is I was just going through and, and thinking about, uh, like, cause there's a, there's a feeling that I get when I'm, when I start going and it, and I try to tap into it. I, and I like it, but I, f it feels, and I know the way it looks when I'm, when I'm doing it, it looks like I'm scattered and all over the place when I'm shooting. Cause like, uh, um, it's, it's, I'm shooting. It's like scared is the way I like, uh, is the way I kind of feel it feel is, uh, is half scared, like nervous. And, uh, like I'm scared to miss something scared to, it's cause I, I, I want to win. And for whatever reason, the reasons change from, from match to match and time to time, you know, like you, you don't want to say that you're targeting a, sp a specific individual or anything like that, but, but sometimes you are. And, uh, sometimes it's just because you you want to win this match or um you know for whatever reason trying to stay hungry so that then you stay scared uh so i i i, I think the thing i wrote down was to to uh stay hungry and shoot scared that's what it was what i wrote down because it's like uh i'll get so i want to win so bad that i'm scared to miss things like not, not and i'm not saying miss a target because I think every time I pull the trigger, I'm going to hit the target. But it's because I've, I've kind of. Here's a good example. Oh, there's our. We shot this troop line, that was a pretty sporty troop line. There's these squares, and you had to shoot one straight in front of you, and then one a little off to the right, and then two way off to the left, and then one farther off to the right. It was like 900 yards. You finished there. You started like 400 and finished at like 900, and. uh the way they were written in the book, it was like it had them listed left to right. And so I, they were in my Kestrel because I always put my my targets in the Kestrel, you know, the, the night before day one. And so I put them in there that way. So I go up and get target direction. I start at one, go to two, go to three, go to four, or one, two, three, four, five. And, well, they were in this one two three four five so the only one that was the right direction was target five and the and so i put the wind speed off of target one um which is right here is what i had it for right but anyways so i go and i start writing down the correct dope because i knew they were out of order but i didn't realize in my mind that that i had them in the wrong order in my kestrel and that was making them the wrong direction and there's the wind I, I start looking at the wind that i've got right now like it's just don't look right there's something wrong and i kept thinking about it and i'm like 
agonizing over this. And then I realized about two shooters in front of me or maybe a shooter and a half in front of me. I was like, oh my gosh, that's what's wrong. So then I had to hurry and put all, redo all the direction, put everything back in. Cause I was sitting there just like, I was scared that I was going to miss something. And sure enough, I did miss something, you know, and I'm always watching and, and it's like, uh, it's like this anxiety in me that I'm going to, that I'm going to miss something. And so it looks like I'm frantic because I kind of am because I want to, I want to figure out and gather as much information as possible and get it figured out so that when I'm, when it's my time and they say, should you ready? And I say, yeah. And the, and the beat goes off, everything else goes away. Just all of it goes away. And the only thing I'm thinking about is, uh, goals and bolt and then just squeeze the trigger. And then where did that round go? And what does that mean for the next shot? And, and so anyways, I ended up cleaning the stage because I figured it out. And, and, uh, but I watched a lot of people after that and they were like scratching their head, trying to figure out what's going on. Cause they did the same thing. And then I told somebody, well, cause I was telling people, but I didn't have time to like go fix everybody else's. I, I just had to get mine ready to go and then shoot. And then after that, then I told them, I was like, Hey, yeah, you ought to check this. Well, I, ch- I told them before, but I didn't have time to explain it. But yeah, that definitely could have been bad. Well, so when you're talking about um, like shooting scare, is or is that like the opposite of overconfidence slash complacency? Uh huh. Yeah, because like we, you, you definitely don't want to be too confident. Like, I, it, there's nothing wrong with being confident in your ability to figure it out, but. Uh, but you you definitely don't want to like you people got to realize that their opponent isn't the, isn't the guy in the squad two down from them or whatever it's it's the it's what's going on right here right now in front of you like the only way to beat that guy to beat Austin to beat Clay to beat whoever all these uh giants the only way you beat them is by figuring out the win figuring out this and making perfect trigger pulls that's the only way to do it. So like when, when I get nervous and stuff like that, like I got a process that I go through, um, before, before a stage starts to where I know I'm prepared and ready to go. And as long as I go through this process, I'm, I, I'm usually good because I am so scattered. I got to have a process to stay organized or, or at least resemble some sort of organization. And, uh, so I got to have this process I go through and then, uh, and then I have a, pro- a shot process as well. And so when I start thinking, all right, I got, I got to hit these targets because the only way I'm going to win this match is if I hit these targets, I got to hit them all. I got to clean the stage. So I make sure that I go through that and then say something happens or, or like I do something wrong or whatever. I just sink farther into that or the more motivation, like when Beamer come up to me and was like, and I was like, oh, how's he doing now? And he's like, you really want me to tell you? I'm like, yeah, that just helps me. I, it don't hurt me. He's like, all right. And he said, you know, he's like, oh, he's doing pretty good, but I think you got him. And I was like, oh, sweet. So, and then I was like, well, blood in the water. I just, I just got to hit the rest of them. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I can, that's an inter- interesting way of, um, of looking at it. And I, you, and you probably don't hear that too often uh, about the, the, you know, and maybe the equating it similar to, you know, like the fear of failure, the fear of missing, right? And that how how that kind of just enhances your focus to be able yeah. to, you know, look at all the things that are involved with that stage, those targets, that wind, the mirage, whatever else, to where you think about all the potential variables and you're almost over prepared rather than under prepared. You know, I mean, is that does that kind of fall in line with what what you think is going through your mind when you're, you know, as you're preparing for these stages? Yeah. Uh, a hundred percent. Like I'm, I'm like kind of, yeah, I'm, I think that's what it is. is what I wrote down is I think I'm scared of missing something. Yeah. Like that, uh, because I mean, like I love to win and I say this a lot. Uh, I do love to win. Winning is fun. And anybody that tells you any different, they, they really, they're lying to you. Cause the fun thing you can do is win. Uh, like, it's fun to go shoot, like, for sure, <laughs> for sure. But it's fun to win. 
and uh the <coughs> sorry no we're good i got a little uh dry throat there for a second <clears throat> the, the only um hang on two seconds i'm about to like cough um yeah we're good buddy All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit while Morgan is 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 lubricating his throat. Um, but you know, I've I've you know I've known Morgan for a number of years, and uh, you know I've asked him this question a lot, and I'm sure he gets these kind of questions all the time because you know when you have that kind of performance that uh, that he's had over these years, people want it. People are asking you all the time, like, "Hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know, why are you do this way? Why do you do it that way?" And I'm sure. Uh, and, and my experience with shooting with Morgan is that, um, you know, that he's, he's very sharing of information. I mean, he's not one of those guys that's going to, you know, that is going to play the gamesmanship too much to the point where they're just don't want to tell you anything or they're being coy with their information, uh, which I don't think does anybody any good, uh, even the shooter. Uh, but that's, that's been a good thing about, you know, especially, and I think you find that that's one of the attractive parts of the sport is that you do find a lot of the best shooters in this sport are that way, that they understand that, you know, that it really comes down not to the information you're telling a guy. It's really you pulling the trigger. You understand what's going on downrange with the wind and mirage and everything else and your ability to do that better than the next guy, not what you're telling them. But, but that the fact that you are sharing that knowledge, I think is a really good thing for the sport because it certainly, it, it, when people are getting into the sport and they understand that you're approachable, uh, and that you're willing to share information that just is invigorating and, and motivating for people to stay in it because they feel like they're getting some tips and secrets and what have you to help them do better. So, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Are you feeling, you feeling better now? Yeah. Yeah. I just had, I was like, all of a sudden it got dry and with my cough already, I was like, Holy moly, I can't hold it back. <laughs> I couldn't even talk, but, wow. uh, no, I, where I was headed is I was just saying, I, I love to win but I think I, I hate losing worse or more than I love winning. And so <clears throat> it's pretty, it drives me, you know, it's like that kind of like that fear of, like you said, fear of failure. And I don't know if it's like, it, it's not a hundred percent the avoidance of failure and avoidance of losing, but um, it definitely, that definitely plays into it the, to drive that hunger, I guess you should say, cause that's where, in all reality, I mean, if you want to win, you're going to figure out a way to do it. Like, you, you look at all of the guys that are really good. There's something in there. And and for most people, if, like, the information's out there, you know, like, to get the information you need to get better to win, it's there. And then when, you, when you're at these matches, uh, like, like, uh, like you said, with information between people, like, like you're, you're going to be able to get – like, especially like you shoot with me and you want to ask questions. I mean, I'll answer your questions all day as long as I'm not on deck or whatever, but I mean, it's, it's fine. But I, I, if you shoot after me, I'll turn around and give you my wing call every time, whether or not it's going to work on the stage. I, I can't be really liable for, but I'll still give it to you. I'll tell you exactly what I held. It's not like it's, um, a secret, you know? Um, and most people come up with the same information I do. It's just a matter of, can you be on top of it in that moment and, and really make sure you make a good trigger pull and make sure you watch it close and make the corrections you need to make. But um, yeah, like I think, but like I say, I, I do think men, your mentality is most or has the most uh, effect on whether or not you win or lose, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I've, that's a the, statistics would indicate that you're not wrong <laughs> yeah but for some reason it's like what's that thing uh, have you seen that uh that deal uh says when people ask me how do you do it and he's like i don't know man i don't know <laughs> that's exactly what i feel like i'm like uh, i don't know well you, you'd like to think you know because because uh like you think you like and people think you have the answer because of success right um but at the same time so there's so many different people that are that are successful but do it maybe slightly different than you that they're like there's something else to it to do you know and you kind of don't really know like jake he's super successful like there's no 
two ways about it. And I think he would agree on the mentality. We've talked about this before. The mentality has a lot to do with it. But then, you know, we do things slightly different here and there. And I know I do things way different than like all a lot of the Oklahoma boys, you know, things that I focus on versus what they focus on sometimes can be completely different. But yet we all come to um, a similar, I guess, uh, end point. Yeah. Hey. Which I guess maybe that's a too cerebral of a concept. <laughs> no, I but, mean, you know, you look at, I mean, I, I played a lot of golf when I was younger and, uh, you know, there, there are some, uh, some absolutely gorgeous, beautiful golf swings out there that you can watch that guy swing a golf club and you're like, Oh yeah, that guy, he is a stud. He is a scratch golfer. And then you see somebody else on the range and they've got this really unusual swing and their, you know, their grips different and, you know, their hip turns different, you know, the way they come into the ball is unusual. And then you start playing with them or you see the results after a, ma- after a, a match and they're like, wow, that guy just beat everybody by five shots. And you are looking at him, it's like, he's, people do things differently, the way they're approached, the way they practice, you know, where they see their strengths and weaknesses and how they, you know, they leverage their strengths and focus on their weaknesses to be able to, you know, to do better, hit more targets, right. You know, to hit more yeah. targets than everyone else. I mean, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, but, um, but you've certainly, you found a good way of doing it over the years, but, and I, I want to ask you about something uh, that I found pretty interesting. I think I asked you about this before, but I think it's something worth sharing. Uh, when when you're when you're down on a rifle, whether you're shooting prone or positional, um, do you do you tend to see trace and vapor trail, or are you one that tends to react more to what you're seeing at the target level, like what how the target reacts, or if you for the rare instances you miss the target, <laughs> you know, like, is that like when you're trying to make an offset to your aim point for your next shot, what are you looking for? Well, uh, I try not to look for trace unless I absolutely have to. That's the only time. And and people, which mean, which makes it to where I'm not as good at as good at it as some people. And I've thought about, you know, maybe kind of, looking into it and maybe practicing it a little bit for the one or two times a year that you need to see trace. But I try and like, and I know that's not like you just hear people constantly just like pound on the trace word so much. And I, it's been popularized by some good shooters and just the saying of that. And I just, maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. I just, I seem to, you see what you look for is what I've decided. Uh, and if you look, if you're looking at the target and you're looking for splash of where the bullet hits, if you want to see exactly where the bullet hits on the plate and you want to see the reaction of the plate or, or you want to see a little puff of dust and be able to center that puff of dust exactly where it is, or be able to see the silver spot, the, the new silver spot that shows up on the plate or, or you want to see the little spot of dirt over here where your bullet hits or whatever you're looking for, you know, like if you, if you're that, that's what you're looking for. That's what you're going to see. And you might catch trace over here somewhere or there. So you miss it, whatever. You might catch something go like this, that, you, that when you needed to see it when you, and when you saw it and you can react to that. But if you're watching trace all the time, if you're just watching this, because if you, if you look for it, you'll see it um, quite a bit. You, you really will. But but you're going to miss a lot of that stuff, which is a lot more precise. It's going to tell you exactly where the bullet was. And this right here is is uh, uh, where the bullet was. It traces never where the bullet is. It's always where the bullet was. And so for people to say, oh, I'm look, watching the trace come in, and then I saw all this stuff. It's not happening. Our brains don't work that fast. It's just it, you, can't, you can't look at the, wa- the wake of a, of a boat and just stare at the wake of a boat and then it crashes into a bridge and be like, man, I watched that thing crash into a bridge. It just doesn't happen because you were watching the wake of the boat. Uh, it, you might see it, you might catch it, you might, but that's, but you were actually looking at the wake. So, and I'm not saying that that isn't relevant sometimes, right? Because it, for some, whatever reason, skyline targets, certain things like that, it's, it's worth looking at, but I would rather watch for, um downrange effects and catch trace 
rather than watch trace and catch downrange effects. So that that's my opinion on it. And the other thing is is reading plates, especially on these uh, target hangers. Uh, what one thing you'll notice is like say say especially say it's between four and six hundred yards when it, when your bullets hit hard. Um, you're you're gonna see a lot of people hit over here. And they'll see this boom like this, and and what happens is 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 you think you hit over here, and then you watch people go like this, and they'll move their crosshair from you know a little bit to the right, and then they go off the right, and they're like, man, that's what you win. It's like, well, no, you just didn't know where you hit, and so uh, that's one of those things where it, if you're looking for it though, it's easier to see, and if you know what you're looking at, it's it's a lot easier. I don't wow. know. If, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, like that, that's, I think for people who are listening to this podcast, that's encouraging <clears throat> because I believe that the majority of the shooters probably struggle with being able to see trace. I mean, I think, I mean, you, we can see it, but being able to see it consistently enough to count on that method of being able to determine where you're going to aim your next shot based on where that previous shot went, like you saying, where the bullet was, not where it is. Uh, like when you told me that, that was, that was encouraging for me because I am not, I do, I, I see trace occasionally, but I certainly don't see it well enough. And whether it's just how my brain works, the fact that my eyes are 57 years old, whatever it might be, I'm just not good at it. But I think I'm pretty good at being able to see like where that bullet impacts the target goes off left, right, high, low, whatever. And that was encouraging because, you know, you hear all these guys talking about seeing trace and paper trail and all that. And I think that, so obviously you, you know, your, your, your method is um, probably more in line mm -hmm. with, I think in line with the abilities of the majority of the shooters out there that they can, if they focus more on what's happening at the target to be able to understand where their next shot is, rather than trying to worry about, you know, trace and vapor trail. I think that's, that, you know, that's, that's, I'm sure there's somebody out there is listening to this going, wow, he's a great shooter and he does the same thing I can do. I need to try harder at that. Yeah. Well, I mean, cause you can get really good at picking up exactly where they are on the plate and all that type of stuff. I just, man, I've never been, I've, I've, I don't know. Trace is just too fickle, right? Like some days it's, it's there more than others, but still a maximum of like, like, I mean, a really good guy on a really good day, is going to see 80 to 90%. Like we're talking like the elite guy on the best day. That's what he's going to see of Trace. And then you get that same guy on just a a day, you know, maybe it's 70% and a bad day, 40%. So now what's he, where, where are you at? You know, like, yeah, on the great day, maybe, maybe it's on par with oh, what I'm doing, but I'm the same all the time. I'm seeing almost every round go down range exactly where it goes right where it hits and if i'm not sure but still hit the plate well then you then you just know well i hit that plate so you shoot the same shot again and then you try to see it even better on the next shot try to pay attention because that's going to be give you the most chance of hitting it um and then the other thing is say you're you are shooting a skyline target right like i did this not too long ago uh where we were shooting I, I, it wasn't a skyline target but i can't remember what it was but i couldn't i couldn't tell where i missed there was no and there was a lot of people that did this and i can't remember if it was at this match or not pretty sure it was uh but i could not tell where i missed or whatever but i was like well the one thing i know is the mirage is not like i there's no way it's the other direction right so it has to be i, I just you i just okay pause for a second look to the conditions in my optic look around you can see all right okay what i miss and uh look at the mirage look at the grass and and make a decision right there okay i was holding this what makes the most what's the most likely direction that i missed off of and i decided at that point that i think it was that i needed to hold more wind or less wind i can't remember but anyway because i just moved I, I took the, I looked at my, I put my reticle right where I, I had it the last time. So let's say I held half a mil and it was, let's just call it a six tenth target to, to, for easy, 
like thinking about it, you know. So I had a half mil in the middle of the plate. So that means on the down downwind side or down uh, downwind side that was eight tenths, right? Is on the edge of the plate. So all I do is I look to where the the bottom edge of that plate was, and I want to put that inside of the other edge. Pull the trigger. That means I moved ninety percent of that plate. So now, the chance of me missing again is very low, because I now we're able to cover in two shots about 1.1 to 1 mils worth of wind in the direction that it should have been, right? Because I all I know is I know one thing for sure when I pull a trigger that between three tenths and eight tenths that didn't work. That's the one thing I know. So, but to rule out like gun air and all that stuff let's only move 90 percent you know and that's that's so that's what i do and that ends up getting me on usually i mean most of the time if i don't see something the next one hits and uh yeah and, and it, the same thing for um the other direction and so you can just do that exact same thing going the other direction and it's crazy how how uh like sort of say you miss again chances are it's not more than that so you then you just take your three tenths and put it inside the other edge. You basically hold center. Yeah. And then now, two when, when shots you, you've covered you, almost two mils. When when you're on a stage like that where you know if you miss the target, you're probably not going to get any feedback from you know a berm or anything behind it. Do you try and and mentally say okay if i miss it's probably because i like i know the wind's moving from left to right i mean i just know it like mirage is moving left to right grass is moving left to right kestrel's telling me left to right you know so if i miss i just know that i just didn't give it enough wind i mean do you try and do you try and kind of set yourself like like that before you take your first shot or would you rather just let your mind work after you've missed to then try and make the decision it's a combination. I want to hit that first. I want to give myself the most chance to hit that first target, right? So I'm going to look at, I'm going to measure. I always pack a spotter with me with a reticle in it so I can measure every target. So then I can be like, okay, I, what? how much wind is this target going to cover? You know, if I hold left edge here, is that enough? If it's left to right and it's 400 yards, you almost got a tenth of spin drift, got about uh, 0.06 of spin drift, you know? So, you know, if it's left to right and you hold left edge, like, your bullet should hit left or it should hit uh, just right of your crosshair right there on the edge of that plate if there's no wind. So I know that I can get away with a little bit holding an edge for sure, even if there's no wind, but how much wind is it? Is it, is it, say it's a half a mil plate. How, how many miles per hour does that cover me? You know? And I, I want to know that. And then, and then, okay, what's the minimum wind that it is here? You know, like, like what is, and I want to know, okay, what's the maximum? And if I can put the minimum and maximum wind on the plate, then I'm going to do that. Um, yep. Even though, even though maybe, maybe that's holding a little upwind or holding a little downwind. I still want to put, if I can put all of it on there, that, and that gives me the best chance of hitting it. And then I pay attention and try to see exactly where I hit. And then from there, make my corrections and move on. Now, do you do that? Uh, okay. So let's just say you got a, you got a, a target that is five tenths wide and it's at 600 yards and you got a full value in coming in from left to right or whatever, you know, do you put in your Kestrel and you've got two winds, do you put like the low wind and the high wind to see how much variation in wind amount there is to be able to stay on, on plate with that half mil wide target? I mean, is that how you do it? Or how, or how, do, you, or how do you handle the high wind or the low wind based on the target width? So I'll look at, so say we got the 600 yard target, right? I'm going to, I'm going to run. And if the wind is say six to 12 is what I, if it's what I'm getting and average in eight, you know, so, or average in nine. So when I, when I do this, I'm like, okay, well that's easy brackets. I can just run a three or I mean a six, a nine and a 12, you know, three mile an hour bracket. But a lot of times, uh, a lot of times in my Kestrel might say four it might say, and it might have a 15 gust, but you know, I bet, but I know watching it most of the time it's somewhere between six and nine and that's, I'll write those down. But a lot of times I have four brackets down. I'll have like a couple of, but I'll have them all written down for every target on a, 
on on the stage and for each direction taken into account and then i'll yeah so i'll run it in like target cards where i got them all all in there at each at the right direction and then and then uh so when i run the wind it it automatically updates it for each direction if that makes sense and then i can i'll put like a so in that case yeah i'd have a six nine and a 12 so i go six and nine run that write it all down and then run a 12 and probably a 15 just to see what the the worst case scenario is and then write them all down and then i'll look at it okay all right so i got my six and i got my 12 and my my target's half mil if i hold nine that that's all in the plate so i'm like okay i got pretty good confidence that that's going to hit it and and when i do hit it say i hit that 600 yard plate and then i say i'm a 10th upwind or 10th downwind i can i can be able to see that read it make a correction and and it's nice if you can make a correction because then you can follow it up and by oh yeah that was right or you know that was too much or whatever and then you can get the wind pretty well dialed just within a shot or two now and you're writing all that data down on your data card oh yeah i got like a book per stage yeah yeah like every stage i got if you look at my arm i'll have about usually about four miles per hour written down four different miles per hour i, mean, I like i like two mile an hour brackets but sometimes like this weekend where it's a little bit more gusty and stuff and i gotta have a uh, cover of larger spans i run three mile an hour brackets uh very rare but if it's like a, a ton of wind and super variable i'll run four mile an hour brackets but most of the time it's two mile an hour brackets almost exclusively and so you, say yes you got a lot of data written down on your card yeah so i can see all the patterns right like what's going on in my mind and i can come up with the patterns because a lot of times i won't even look at my arm board people like because i i run a tape you've seen my turrets where it's you know, I got like a white turret so that I can just write down each dope on there. And then I'll look at my arm board. And if I'm going to run that nine mile an hour, you know, because I know it's average in that, I'll just look at the splits between them. Right. So say, let's just say we have three targets or, or five or whatever. We we'll go five. Say I'm going to start. I'm like, I don't have to remember what I'm going to start with. Almost everybody's got that like imprinted into their soul by the time the, by the, time the stage starts. You know, I'm going to start with five tenths. You know, you know that, like, that's the one where you don't, you don't even got to remember it, but you know, your next one, say it's 700 and then you got to go 750 and then you got to go 950 and say a thousand fifty. Right. So, so your next one, it says, okay, I want to go, I need to add, uh, let's say a 10th of wind and the next one. So, so it's like six tenths and then say, let's go at six, five and then the next one you got to go to 950 so it's add two to that one because now it's uh it's like nine tenths right and then and then the 1050 one is another add two so so it's it's at a 1.1 that's what your wind is you go five uh five six six and a half nine one one so so let's just simplify it and call that six a six and a half a seven so all you the only thing you have to remember is one one two two so one one two two that's all you gotta remember and it doesn't matter what happens so you shoot the first one and it goes you and and you do this based off patterns right you know if it goes a little bit higher those splits might get a little bigger on the back side and then they might get a little smaller as you go on when you go down a little bit but by the time you've done, done writing it down and looking at all that you kind of know like, oh, if it's lower, I might only be adding a tenth and a half. And if it's higher, I might be right adding um, two and a half by the time I get to the far ones. Um, just just knowing that intuitively, but you know, one, one, two, two will hit the plates. Like if you just, if you go up there and your first shot, you you hit it at three tenths and then you go, okay, well, three tenths work, boom, whack, boom, okay, three tenths. So then you just go add one. So I'm, I'm at one. So four tenths, boom, whack, boom. And say you hit that a little bit strong again. So you're like three and a half or whatever. You're like, oh, okay, I'll add one again. Let's go. Let's just hold, let's hold five. Boom, good, boom, good. You know, and now all of a sudden, now I need six on that target. Now you add two. You're at an eight at the next one. And then, 
pretty soon you're you're right back in there and it's going to get you within a half a tenth almost on on your if you were to go backwards and look and say okay i needed this what did i need for the next one and run it in your kestrel for n versus what you see it's like it's within human error and that's the fastest way like that i don't do always do it that way like well, most of the time I, I like to look at my arm board, like if you have time and stuff, but some matches, you just don't have the time for that. You're just, you're, you're a lot of 90 second matches anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, now do you, do you typically dial wind or are you holding wind or both? I hold wind. I hold wind. I mean, there is very rare. I will, I will dial some wind, but it's pretty rare. Uh, I I just I just hold it because there's no real downside. Like uh, I don't understand sometimes the dialing because especially when I hear, "Oh man, I left wind in the gun," <laughs> they start laughing because I'm like, "Well, if you just held it, you'd hit the exact same amount of targets, and that wouldn't have happened on the next stage." Because it's I don't know. We just have such good reticles nowadays. Yeah, that's certainly well. Rarely need. <clears throat> You know, it was interesting that when our podcast last week with Keith Baker and he knew the range he was going to up there at, uh, at Pig River, it, it can tend to, wind can mess with you a lot and you've got a lot of targets that don't give you feedback, you know, that you're shooting into <clears throat> into nothingness, you know, mm-hmm. shrubs and trash and whatever else, not berms with you know, immediate feedback. And in preparation for the match, he, he was trying to, dial more wind and he felt like he kind of did he had some practice days where there's a lot of wind and and he he consciously dialed more than he held which is different than what he normally did and he felt that was one of the things that kind of helped him do better at that match you know but you know but i you know i i don't know it, it's a you know i used to shoot a um a night force um mil cf1 reticle which had, I love the reticle. It was it wasn't busy. I could see everything, but it wasn't a Christmas tree. So, you no, know, it's a great reticle. Yeah. I mean, if you, if, so if I'm having to, if I'm having to, if I'm having to hold wind and elevation on a holdover stage, that was a disadvantage, you know, and now I'm running that PR2 reticle and that Leopold Mark V and been very happy with it, you know, so that there certainly opens up a lot more of the ability to hold, but, you know, but I, it'd be interesting that, you know, you, I wonder what percentage of the top 100 shooters, dial wind versus hold wind you think it's 50 50 uh i don't know I, it seems like a lot of people do a combination and i don't see nothing wrong with it like you got to have a a a good a good system in place to to get around leaving wind in the gun because it's an easy thing to do like if i ever do dial wind which i do from time to time i'm not going to tell you lie and tell you i don't but i will but what I do is I is if if I put wind in the gun, the turret comes off and it don't, and it put, goes in my pocket until I zero it out, or the the cap the cap comes yeah. off the windage turret goes in my pocket, and so it stays there. And if the cap goes back on, that turret is zeroed. I and that's just how it is. I won't I will not put it on unless it's zeroed, and and it's so it's really easy to see like oh I got wind in the gun, or I don't have wind in the gun because. And you just know that. And if you just get disciplined where you just will not take the cat or you will not put the cat back on until zero, it kind of keeps you out of some trouble. So, so that's why I like the night force for that reason. Cause you can do that on the night force and you can do that on this one. Um, but, and if you're used to doing it and then if I do touch the windage, say I touch the windage at a, at a match, I will uh, pull the cap off almost every stage after that. And just like, they'll be like, shoot ready. Well, no. Nope take it off check it put it back on just just to make sure yeah because i'm so paranoid about it and so uh like that's another one of them shooting scared things like i'm so scared you know and so i'm like frantically just kind of trying to figure out make sure everything's ready all the time and uh so i i know it can be done and there's not not a disadvantage but i don't know that there is an an advantage i guess because especially on sometimes where there's a lot of wind and it's variable and all of a sudden you're shooting and some guys are really good at this because they're used to doing it. But, uh, see I've, and I've had this happen before where I dialed 
and then I pull the trigger, and then I needed to hold less wind. So I'm holding, I have a half mil dial, and I'm holding two tenths less. So I, it's only three tenths, right? Well, to be able to come up with that, like, oh, I'm only holding three tenths, and then I need to extrapolate that or interpolate that for the next target to figure something out. And then I'm having to do some thinking, and your brain can get fried real fast. Whereas if you were zeroed, you'd still hit the targets, and you know, oh, I'm three tenths, and then I got to go. Uh, the next, oh, I look at my thing. Okay, fine. Point three, okay. Point four on the next one, or point five, you know, whatever. But that, that's why I like it because I, I just don't see a huge advantage of it. And I don't know, Tate's. Uh, I've talked to Tate about this a little bit. Tate, his argument, and, and it, which is a decent argument, is that some new guys have a tough time like holding that much win, uh, like especially like this weekend. You know, we held. Uh, over two mils a couple times you know uh and then and for their reticle to be the center of their reticle to be clear over here and the target be clear over here like that that's like a like nerve wracking for people you know like i want it to be over here you know here's the target i want it to be right here not over here you know and but in my mind that's not i'm not even going up that's not even a, a thought i guess and i but i figure you can get over that fast right yeah um I know that's well. I've heard that that can be a thing. Like um, people that are not used to shooting in wind, that's definitely a, a like a thing where they're like they always want to hold less wind. You know, like they'll see they'll they'll write something down. They always want to hold the the closest to the target because they're so scared that the farther away they get from the target that they're gonna miss. Um, because it back home that's yeah. true. Yep. You hold off plate, you miss plate. So. It's like, but around here, if you hold plate, you miss plate. Well, I, I like that idea about taking, you know, taking your turret cap off and your windage, you know, when you dial wind, I mean, like that just, and having that thing in your pocket, because we're always putting things, our hands in our pockets, you know, getting ammo and brass and whatever else out. And you reach in and you fill that turret cap, like, oh my gosh, I forgot to put my wind back. Yep. You know, so I'm like, I, I might have to try that. Um, and, and you see it like, right. Every time you walk up to your gun, you're like, something's wrong. You know, like, it's like, it's like grabs my eye like oh my turret caps off so i must have wind in the gun even if i don't it still it makes me think about it so i go check it you know yeah plus i have another you know part of my pre-stage process i still going to go through the turrets anyways but it's just an extra fail safe for when i do it because man i watched brian niece this weekend he's a prime example uh he ended up tying for like seventh to ninth or whatever and uh at the match and he was three points away from third right it's all in and uh our fourth to last stage which was a pretty easy stage he goes up there he dials six tenths of wind and he cleans the stage because he wanted to be able to hold over for the next target or whatever he was doing that a lot and i was just dialing the elevation for every target whatever you know because it's a two minute it's a two minute match and it's a lot of wind, so you're more worried about that than anything. So I just dialed every everything I could, except for obviously windage. Um, I was tempted to dial windage a couple times at the match, but uh, better judgment prevailed, I guess. I don't know if it really it wouldn't have mattered, but uh, anyways. Um, so he cleans the stage, um, and we go to the next stage, and it's off this uh this culvert pipe. You had to shoot two targets out of the out of the culvert and then get up on top of the culvert and shoot three more. And it was a good 30 degree or well, 20, 25 degree pan between target one and target uh, five. And it was this big old long troop line out to like 900 yards on these little animal targets. And so you, you shoot and he shoots the first, his first round, it goes way left. And I was like, wow, the wind died on him. And that's exactly what he thought. So he cut wind, boom, whacked a little tiny one underneath the first target um, and I was like, sweet, he's going to get a nine the hard way. Well, then the next one, he goes a little left. And so he's like, man, the wind's dying. So he just boom, whacks that one, goes out, does that one more time, and then hits the last four rounds, gets a seven. And I was like, good shooting, man. And he's like, yeah, 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 whatever. So he gets a seven, and I got an eight with my wind correct. And uh, so, I mean, I was like, you know, that's not a bad stage. Well, then we go to the next one, and it's kind of a positional troop line where but it was a huge pan it was almost 60 degrees where one way your full value well not quite full value but 
but it's almost full value. And then you come back the other direction and the wind's a little bit right to left. So it's, it's coming left to right the whole time. And then you're back and then it's a little bit almost right to left at this target. So you should be straight up at the one over to the right and you should be like six tenths again or more at the, at the left one. Well, he's like, he shoots um, his first one over here and he was like way left. And he's like, well, that's weird. You know, the Mirage is a little right to left, but not that much. And then he comes over the other one and then he, again, he holds, he, now he holds six tenths and he's way left. He's like, what the crap? That should be zero. So then he, he comes back to the other one. So then he's holding, and he can't figure out what's going on. Like, why am I, why am I off? And ended up getting, only getting a one on the stage. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like he finally figured out at the end. He, I think he looked at his turret and then was mad and he had two rounds left and he only hit one of them. He just reached up for it and then boom, boom, as fast as he could. And then just walked off. I, I could just hear him. I had six tenths in the gun and just goes and puts his gun in the golf cart. He was so mad, oh which I mean, it, and it, and it, the thing was, is yeah, it hurt land. And then we went to the next stage and it was a pretty tough little troop line on some little animals. That's the one I dropped three on and he goes up there and cleans it. And like he was shooting good. And in fact, he would have, if he would have had his turret zeroed, he probably would have been right there in points uh, with me on day two. Um, he, we were actually shooting really close before his little windage debacle. He was only down nine and then he dropped another and then he dropped 12 in two stages. Wow. Um, Man. And he only needed three to be third. So he was like, he's sick over it. And that's where I'm like, so just that chance alone, I guess, is my argument against it, I guess. Now, I'm not saying that that you can't overcome it and there's not ways to overcome it, but it just does. It sucks when it bites you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it did. I don't know. I, I, I tend to be one that likes to hold wind. You know, I'm an East Coast shooter, though, and, you know, we certainly don't have the wind that you guys have out there, but um, I just have always just – and I, I have my fear is just doing that. You know, you, you dial the wind in or, you know, I'll, I'll dial the wind in and then what the wind actually is, is just completely different. And then I'm trying to recalculate how much I dial, what the wind actually is. And then it just, I have brain scramble, you know, on the clock. Yep. But, um, yep. you know, but I don't know. That's the one thing I think that, you know, just whatever method you're going to use, just stick with it, you know? And yep. And don't let don't let somebody or a situation what have you kind of talk at it. I mean, look, if you got to hold three mils of wind, it's kind of hard to hold that and do a holdover, you know. But no, I I get that <laughs> scenario. Like there's certain times where, and that and what he was doing is not bad because he was doing a lot of like if it was a ninety second match, I would have done a lot of what he did, right? Because there was he there was a lot of the or a couple of these two target stages that were like, you know, like a 10, 15 degree um, pan between them. And you had to be able to hold over a little bit, but you got to still hold all a wind. And the holdovers are not, you know, it's like eight tenth holdovers and you don't really have much wind in your reticle right there to be able to then still hold six tenths at one and then seven tenths of the other one or whatever. Like you don't have that. But if you, if you dial five tenths or six tenths in and then just hold a little left center on the next one, um, at your holdover, well, shoot, you can do that. And I would have done that a bunch probably, if it wasn't uh, like a two minute match where, where like it's all about you through it, it ends up coming down, down to how well you're able to think through uh, the uh, wind debacle that's getting thrown at you all the time. So it's more of a thinking game than a, than a speed game. You know, he get done with 30 seconds on the clock. Yeah. He cleaned a lot of them, but then, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to throw him under the bus so much, but it's the example I have. So I'm sure he'll, if he's listening to this, he'll probably, I'll probably get a phone call, but <laughs> well, uh, he, he may, he may be reevaluating his, his wind holding methods. <laughs> no, I mean like, cause in there I was like, man, you can, cause we could have used, I mean, there's two minutes, may as well use them all, you know, just dial your elevation. And plus, I mean, you know, I was I was going pretty slow through almost everything and still finishing with, you know, 15 to 20 seconds left, 
you know, and they, but he would finish going pretty slow with 30 seconds left, you know, yeah. just because he didn't have to, he didn't have to, uh, um, he didn't have to dial. Um, but like you could hurry, like I've done it plenty on stages like that where you can, you can kind of do it with uh, a little bit of purpose and still get dial everything and get through in 90 seconds. No problem. So, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, so let's talk a little bit about your equipment. Um, yeah. What kind of optic are you running? Leopold Mark five with the PR two reticle. It's hard to beat that thing, especially for the money. It's, oh, it's yeah. almost like cheating for the money, honestly. <laughs> now that, and you've won a lot of matches with that optic. Yeah. I think 22. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I won a few with it. Yeah. Now, did you, uh, did you have, and, you, and you've been, you've been with loophole for a number of years now. Um, did you have yeah. anything to do with the design of that reticle? Oh, yeah, not really. I mean, that's kind of John's baby. Uh, I like when I came in, it was, it, we got, I got a prototype with it in there and stuff and gotta be like, good job guys. <laughs> Go team. I, I mean, well, there was like a, a second edition that uh, basically a few people, um, including me, we kind of gave our thoughts on like, hey, we ought to try this or this or this or this. And the second the second edition was what we have today. It was pretty much spot on. The first one was just a little thinner and had, had a couple of the markings on the elevation were just a smidge different. And this way is better. And so, yeah, that's about, I didn't really, yeah, not really. It just kind of, I was there when it happened. It was, and it was, yeah, I don't know. That one, there's, there's, it's probably, if it's not the best reticle, it's, it's at least one of the best reticles. That's for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, it sure has been good to see, uh, Leupold, you know, you look, I remember, at the finale at triple C in Crescent, Texas, you know, the last one that Ron Castle ran yeah. that uh, John Snodgrass and I can't remember the other fellow's name from, uh, from loophole were there, you know, and they were, mm -hmm. and I, I happened to be one of the, one of the better squads that match. And they were, um, they were kind of watching everything and it was good to see them from that point forward, really take a much more serious approach to being involved in the PRS because prior to that, they were, I mean, everyone's heard, heard of Leopold. I mean, they're an icon, an optic yeah. American manufacturer, you know, and just yeah. had such a little presence in the PRS. Yeah. From that point forward to now you go out in a match and, you know, golly, they, they are, they're doing it right. I mean, their presence in the market, you know, that, that Nick and, um and and brad wright you know those guys are out there shooting in matches you know they, yep. they man they're they've listened to shooters and they've got a, a great optic and and uh it's you know it's a, it's reasonably priced i mean it's a it's a the reason why you see so many of them out there yeah that's where like i won my first one that's why i, I won my first match with a tangent and then it wasn't a couple months later i had a had a leopold on there just because i had a couple issues with my tangent and I was like, whatever. And I got, and I, I just bought a Leopold because I could afford it, you know, and I knew they were good enough. So I was like, well, well, let's try this out. And then, uh, you know, I bought it and then ended up, uh, I don't know, like a year later, um, after, you know, winning some other stuff with it, I, uh, they were like, Hey, you want to shoot for us? I was like, sure. And then found out they were making a new reticle and all that. And that's kind of cool, but they've gone, yeah, where they've come from then is huge. I remember the first reticle I ran in that scope, it was not that great. And now all of a sudden where they are, and it's just ho so hard to go buy something else when you can get as much scope as you do for that amount of money. It just, it just, it uh, competes with scopes costing, you know, a thousand, 1500 bucks more than it and hangs with them. Absolutely. But, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, well, it's one of the reasons why you see so many, so many of them on the line out there. Yeah. hundred percent. It's great. Uh, what kind of, what kind of either mount or rings are you running? Yours. Yeah. MPA. The, okay. Yeah. The MPA mounts are nice. All right. And, uh, what kind of action? Uh, Lone Peak Arms. Uh, it's a fusion. They're, 
I mean, uh, I I tell people this all the time. It's there's two. Yeah, if you want a good action, you got two options: an impact or a long peak. That's about it. And uh, pick one. You can't go wrong. Uh, both of them are great. So, uh, yeah. The the only real difference is all long peaks come with an AW cut and trigger pins, and impacts. Um, you have to request it, but you can get an AW cut, and they have trigger hangers so it doesn't really matter and i mean they feel almost identical they a lot of parts are almost the exact same if not the exact same because they know each other you know and they communicate some and like they're good people both companies you know so it's kind of like it's hard to it's hard to find fault with either one of them and that the one it's a two lug uh 90 degree both row yep yep which i like because you know, some people like the 60 and stuff, but I just like the how light uh, a 90 is. Like a, a good 90 is going to be really light yeah, and smooth where you just can't get away from a 60 just being a little bit heavier. It's just the, ma- fa- the fact that you're, you're spreading the uh, force across a lot greater area. It just is just simple, you know. So, but that being said, I got to put my hat on backwards to run it. If I was running a 60, I wouldn't have to do that. I know. And what kind of trigger are you running? Uh, Bix and Andy Taxport Pro. Uh, and what, what uh, kind of, what kind of, what kind of pull weight? Four ounces. Light. Okay. Yeah. I, I So there's different I, ideas on that. Like uh, people are like, oh, so you must punch it. And I was like, well, no, I mean, I can. I mean, you, I feel like sometimes punching has got to be in your, I shouldn't say that, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be somewhere in your bag of tricks, but almost everybody knows how to do that. Like it, it's your default, right? Most people, when you get into shooting, you just do punch it. Like this is what it is, but a hundred percent of what I do practicing and I've, I've gotten to where now I rarely, if ever do, the only time I really punch it is on a PRS skill stage or, uh, on uh, a mover. Cause I feel like you almost just have to on a mover because, uh, there's just not enough time to, to try to squeeze it or off. Um, but I like it light so that I don't have to know when the gun's going to go off to, to still get through a stage in a timely manner. Right. I want to be able to just slowly add weight and then the gun go off and me not know exactly when it's going to go off. I want to know it's going to go off in the next half a second to two seconds, but I don't want to know when. So I just want to squeeze, 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 boom, it goes off sometime. And then away we go. So that, you know, I'm not like doing anything, um, and anticipating the shot. When you say punching, you mean like when you're doing that? Well, even like, if you got your finger on the trigger, a lot of people can punch and make it look really, really nice. Uh, Cause they'll just go, uh, punching can be just like squeeze, squeeze now. If that makes I sense. You. You're like, I want the gun to go off now. And what, what you don't understand is you might think that you're not doing anything to the gun. But you are like there's if you know when the gun goes off, that means your body knew when to react. And if your body knows when to react, it's going to react before the gun goes off because it, it, it knows what's coming. Anytime you blow something up two feet in front of your face, your body will react to it, especially if you know what's coming. In fact, every time it will react to it. It's just it's just a matter of I want to control the timing and when in which I react to it. The reaction is not bad. The timing of the reaction is the thing. I want I want the reaction to come after the gun after the explosion happens, not before the explosion happens. The problem with punching or saying now is you're 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 automatically telling yourself when to react, so you will react. The the level of your reaction, people think you can train that out, but you can't. Actually, the better the more you the more you shoot, the the better you are and the faster you are reacting. So the, the, the reaction will actually come closer to the shot and you're, you'll first think I didn't do anything there, but you actually did. You just didn't know it. And so it will, it will cause different shifts in your point of impact and stuff. So my, my goal is to, to make sure that I don't know when it goes off so that I react after the explosion. Gotcha. Wow. We're going to talk more about that. And after you win the next match, I want, I want to get deeper into that, but I don't want, I don't want the thing to go on forever tonight. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what kind what kind of chassis are you running? Uh, the matrix, uh, standard matrix with the matrix pro, um, 
rear end. I got you. Okay. And are you betting your chassis? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that you need to, but uh, it's more of like the reason why I I feel like I do is because uh, I just like when my, when my, uh, my action drops in every time that my levels, everything will line up the same every time. So I don't have to like readjust anything or anything. I want, I want the chassis level to match the level on my scope. And then that to um, match, like I have the little send it level with the, the Brant built deal on it. It's got the lights. I don't know if you've seen those. Yep. Oh yeah. But it, yeah. It runs to send it back. So I want all that to line up every time. I So if I pull it out, pull it, put it back in every sitting, everything's the same. Well, yeah. I mean, like people, you know, of course people ask me all the time about betting and, you know, I'm mean, look, it's either, it's either going to help or it's not going to do anything. I mean, but yep. having, uh, creating a perfect cradle, a perfect cradle, you know, between any kind of machining variances on, on the action and the chassis and you're eliminating those by betting. Like that's not a yep. bad thing. <laughs> you yep. know? So um, I want a lot of matches with, with, with chassis that aren't bedded. Right. Yeah. It's only been about a year, year and a half that I just decided, you know what? Let's do it all so that I don't ever have to worry about that level thing. Yeah. One less thing to worry about. Got tired of rotating scopes every time I'd uh, move stuff around. Now I don't have to worry about it. Uh, What kind of bipod are you running? Um, I run a, the um, MDT sky pod most of the time. That's kind of my go-to. I got also have, what's that one that uh, we got? Thank you, Zach. Yeah. I got one of those. Yeah. I got a Harris kind of just depends on my mood. <laughs> I, I do like that little bench rest Harris. It's hard to beat that little thing. It's yeah. so nice. It's very compact. Matches. Oh yeah. It's just compact flips up out of the way. Once you throw the little, uh, the rat deal on there. Mm-hmm. I, I actually flip the rat around backwards. And so then you have more can't. Oh, you really? ever done that? Yeah. Well, it's been a long time since I ran a Harris. <laughs> but, oh, well, yeah, you see, because, like, if you flip the rat thing backwards, which is left-handed, funny enough. Well, I see I'm sure saying, you, yeah. well, you could put the other, You I actually, you can flip the, the rat around, too, I guess. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you put it on backwards, it puts the uh, the thing behind these deals. And so you get just, like, I don't know, another 10, to, maybe 10 or 5 degrees both sides of can't yep. sometimes you it need makes a little bit better in the mountains yeah oh yeah yeah it's nice uh what, what kind of break are you running uh the um tmb this the um strike without warning tmb called the aussie break and that's that's it's a tuner it's a tuner break yeah okay yeah here's this is i'll show you the got a prototype probably shouldn't do this but i think it's supposed to come out today finally but it's got like a Forcer Giant. Wow. How many is that? It's five forks? Five. Yeah, it's got like a... He has inserts in there. They're like cones. I don't know. It it seems to work pretty decent, but uh, at least uh, it's better than anything I have tried. I haven't, I haven't tried yours yet. Your new one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get that one out to you here shortly. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah, I I do like that break though. That thing works pretty dang good. I, yeah. Who does uh, Who does your gunsmithing work? Uh, Priest Precision out of Ogden, Utah. Garrett Priest. He Garrett Priest. Yeah, builds good rifles. It's hard he sure does, do. man. I tell you what, he um, you know, he's kind of got that machining background. You know, he he understood it and got it was in machining before he got into gunsmithing and building rifles, yep. and I think that's helped out a lot. But Garrett's a great guy. I mean, just what a kind of low key and quiet, but man, he he's a very good shooter and a very good gunsmith. Really good dude. Oh yeah, he's kind of, and his name's kind of got out there a little bit more. I always seem to see more and more of his rifles out on the line. But uh, I've been with him, and he's been with me since kind of the beginning. Yeah, uh, he started. Good, good guy. Yeah, he's already. Um, what kind of what kind of bullets do you, are you typically running? A single manufacturer, or do you move around? Or no, I run. Uh, 156 burger stream outer limits um hunting they're actually a hunting bullet but yeah they're pretty dang good it's hard to beat them bullets i used to one uh run 153 and a halfs but it just kind of they didn't they couldn't find them at the time or get them to me at the time 
And I don't know, it's been about a year and a half ago. They, they're like, well, you, can you take some of these? You try them? I'm like, sure. And I, and I got them and, uh, Brian Black from Lone Peak Arms, he had a pointing die already set up for him. So I just started pointing them all. So they have the exact same BC event essentially as the 153 and a halfs and the load data and everything lines up the same. You just throw the same amount of powder in same and they load to the same seating depth. You just away you go and they're pointed. And, uh, so it's basically like shooting a 153 and a half with an extra two and a half grains. And, and that's but, in a six, five Creed more. Yep. Out of six, five Creed. Wow. And uh, what kind of powder are you running? Uh, N150 actually, uh, right now, uh, I've tried N16, I've had N160, 4350, it's all good. It don't, it not, it don't really matter. And on that, um, and what, 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 what kind of speed are you running? Uh, those 156s? I shoot for 2680. That's where they like One, to be, I think. 2680. Wow. Yeah. And, and what twist rate is, is in the barrel? Seven and a half, but, I've ran probably my best shooting gun was an eight. Wow. So it don't, it doesn't matter. That that's now, do you feel that, you know, and, and you're, you're, you were kind of a trendsetter and moving, like, it's funny how the market was shooting six fives and they went six, six millimeters. And now there's a trend back to, you know, 25 cal and six fives. And I think you kind of started some of that here back last year. Um, is that pretty much your primary caliber now? Is that six five? Yeah, I think, uh, I decided last January that, that that was all I was going to shoot. And so that's what I went to. Cause before that I had kind of switched back and forth for a year, uh, in 2021, I think. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Keep my years together. About halfway through 2021, I started, uh, switching back and forth. So I was like, why not? You know, like maybe this, this is a six, five match. This is a six match. And I still have a, a dasher laying around, but, uh, now, for last year, I just decided whatever. I'm just gonna shoot my six five Creed, and uh, man, it did stun me good. I, I cannot uh, knock the six five Creed because, yeah, it just seems to hammer about every time I pull it out. So I mean, so does a Dasher, but like say for my style, we talked about that tray steel. I'm looking for downrange effects, and uh, what better way to get more downrange effects than put a bullet on target that's 50 percent bigger than the last one you were using <laughs> <laughs> that's true you think about that yeah that's pretty that's great man yeah. okay well let's see here so we're about to wrap things up tonight uh are there any sponsors or people that you would kind of like to shout out to or or, or kind of thank here during the podcast yeah i appreciate you uh standing by behind me for so long and taking care of me it's it's been a fun ride and you've been with me since I feel like the beginning, you know, I remember, uh, the first match I ever won, that was, uh, with an MPA chassis and, uh, I have not, uh, looked back ever since. It's like, I, I remember that one. Yeah. It's hard to, to not remember your, the matches you win, even oh, though, yeah. you know, it's, but the first one, there's something to it special. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, to, You've been there. I remember when you called me after that because I won the after I won that when you called me and you're like, you know, hey, if you ever need anything, you just let me know. And he, yeah, been able to take care of me for a long time, and I sure appreciate it. It's been a good ride, so, that's for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, then there, I know there's a lot of people uh, that uh, I should thank, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been a fun, it's been a fun road. Uh, the past this past weekend, uh, really my cleaning rods what got me through this one. <laughs> I almost had, I almost had, I know you're talking almost, about, yeah, <laughs> it was a bad deal, and, and but yeah, we made it through. So, excellent, I'd like to thank the old cleaning rod. Well, I have a feeling that we're probably going to have uh, another uh, episode this uh this year uh i'm quite sure you're probably going to win we another should. match or, or several and and we'll talk about some of those other things in the next in the next podcast but um but i think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up tonight uh so this is uh okay. this is week seven of season one of the winter circle um 
Morgan, I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, great insight. Really, really good stuff tonight, dude. That's uh, that's that's some great information. I'm sure that there are going to be people that are going to listen to this and they're going to go back and listen to it again, because I think you really threw some great nuggets of information out there. Uh, it's certainly going to help me some things you said tonight, uh, or, which is part of the reason why I do this too, because I get to talk to all these match winners and it helps me shoot better. So, um, but it's been a great episode. I certainly appreciate it, buddy. And, um, and to all you listeners out there, thank you for watching and listening. And uh, we're going to sign off now and thank you for watching. <laughs>